Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Brittany Smith Podcast. I'm your host, Brittany N. Smith, your favorite brand designer and brand strategist. And I'm excited today because we have another amazing entrepreneur, another lady boss who's killing the game. Yes. Um, and she's here to share with us um, a little bit about some of the legal side of business. Um, and I don't know about you, but there are still some moments where we talk about legal and business and it's like, Ugh, because yeah. it's, you know, it could be confusing. It's like taxes. Like if you don't know, you just don't know. Exactly. Um, but uh, we have Kiana Chenault here. She's going to break some things down for us and put it into terms that we can understand um, and just help us get on the right foot in the beginning of this new year. It's still the new year. Okay. I know it's February something, but it's still the new year. So Kiana, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. Kiana is representing ATL. I'm going to say the dirty self. <laughs> I'm not dirty, but no, she's not dirty, but you know, <laughs> I'm just playing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, um, so thank you so much again. Um, so Kiana, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, a little, a little bit about your business and how you kind of got into, um, this space that you're in. Yes, yes, um, of course. So again, my name is Kiana and I am representing Atlanta, but I'm also representing Baltimore, Maryland. That's where I'm from. Um, I moved to Atlanta, I guess, about 12 years ago. I cannot believe it's been 12 years. The time has flown by. Um, but I moved here in 2009 after finishing college at Howard University. Go by his names. Um, and so I'm definitely a Howard chick, you know, I take Howard everywhere I go and I, you know, I just, I love just HBCUs in general, but, um, but anyway, so I moved here after finishing Howard and I worked at Lockheed Martin, which is a major defense contractor. You may have heard of it. Um, but I worked in the government security department, wonderful company, but it was just not for me. I was very, very bored. <laughs> and I was just like, Lord, I know you're used to me here to do this. <laughs> um, and so, you know, um, I went back to school and got my master's in uh, public administration while I was working at Lockheed Martin. And, um, you know, got my master's and I said, OK, now I'm going to get into government work. And so I really had a heart and, and Howard really um, just fine tuned this in me. But I really had a heart for um, eradicating or, or just doing more to help our justice system. You know, when I was at Howard, we just really learned about the community. We learned about the uh, school to prison pipeline. We learned about mass incarceration. We learned about the mental health crisis, you know, in our prison system. And I was just like, wow. And so I really wanted to do something about um, the cycle, you know, a lot of cycles that our people get, you know, wrapped up into um, with the justice system. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go into politics. I'm going to write all these awesome laws. And I'm going to end mass incarceration. You know what I mean? I was young. Um, I was idealistic. And, um, you know, I, I just believe that I could do anything. And I really think that's an important aspect that we should try to hold on to from our youth. A lot of times we start adulting and we forget that we had dreams and that we had aspirations and that God put something in us that he expects us to fulfill. Um, but anyway, so I came um, to Georgia and I got my master's. So I said, OK, now that I have my master's, I'm going to do what I'm really supposed to be doing. And um, unfortunately, I got my MPA and I still I, I still wasn't able to get into certain doors with the government or the salary was just it was low, you know, compared to what I was making in the private sector. So I was like, oh, what am I going to do now? And so I thought about getting my um, doctor's degree. Um, but my husband, well, he wasn't my husband at the time. We were dating, but he was like, "Won't you go to law school?" And I'm like, "No, I'm not going to law school. I never wanted to go to law school. I just assumed being a lawyer was too hard. It wasn't even something on my radar." And so when he said that, I said, "Okay, maybe I will go to law school." And I began to think about it. That same year is when uh, Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. And I watched that whole trial and I like, I was like, man, I just know this man about to go away. He done shot this baby in the chest um, and he got, he was acquitted. And I said, excuse, excuse me, right. I said, what right. law is this? Stay in your ground. What law is this? Right. So after that happened, I said, no, I'm going to law school because this, this cannot happen again. 
Right. Um, this stay your ground law. It has to go away. It has to be modified. Something needs to happen because this is not okay. And so I go to law school with the fervor and the passion to really affect change through the law. And again, get into law school, got really good grades. You know, professors are like, oh, you can go to top law this, you can do this, you can do that. I said, I could do what? <laughs> and so, um, you know, I just, I had all these options and I just, I kind of drifted away from what my true passion was. And if I tell you everything, we're going to be going here for a while. So I'm not going to tell you everything. <laughs> God brought me back to my true passion in my last year of law school. And I said, OK, I know I want to do civil rights and criminal defense. That was really my passion. And I kind of got back to that right before I left school. So thank God for that. After I finished law school, I uh, clerked for a federal judge for about 10 months. And then from there, I went into prosecution. So I was the prosecutor for um, Fulton County District Attorney's Office, which is the largest prosecutor office in the Southeast, um, in the whole nation. And so wow. a lot of crime flows through Fulton County. Um, you know, Atlanta is in Fulton County. And so we get all the things, all the crazy things that you see in the news that happened in Atlanta that came to our office. And so I was very busy. Um, I was in court all the time, but I learned so much about criminal law. I learned so much about the state side and um, while I went into that position to affect change, right, that's always my goal, change the justice system, I found myself just kind of being used as a pawn. And I said, wait a minute, so I can only enforce the laws that are on the books. I can't go into court and be like, no, Your Honor, we're doing X, Y, Z. You know, in law, we have something called precedent, right? And so that precedent is built on the ruling of the previous judge. And that ruling is built on the ruling of the previous judge. And so when we use precedent in law, that precedent is either going to hurt you or it's going to harm you. I mean, it's going to help you or it's going to harm you. But more often than not, when we're talking about people of color, it's going to harm us. You know, jurisdiction and, and, and jurisprudence is really skewed towards against us, you know? And so it doesn't really help us. But I began to realize that and I said, Okay, Lord, I, I can't be a prosecutor anymore, especially after Ahmaud Aubrey had been. There, there have been several, you know, oh, since God. Trayvon Martin, like there it's, have been several, like too many to count. Too um, many. You know, it's it's disheartening even. I mean, and I know we can really, you know, kind of go off the deep end here, right here. You All know, right. I remember when Sandra Bland happened. Oh. Um, and because I feel like up until Sandra... Yeah. It was males, you know what I'm saying? And so then when when she was killed, I was like, oh, snap. Like, it, it just it just compounded yes. the emotion and the thoughts and all of that. So to hear, you know, that, that the passion that you had um, was ignited with Trayvon Martin, I can only imagine how you've been, you know, kind of on this, like, rah, like the tenacity and you've been built up. Right. since you got started with with this line of work so um i'm i'm grateful you know that the lord is touching people's hearts in that way to fight for um civil rights to fight for you know just the safety of not not even just our people but the safety of people of civilians right oh, yes. um you know and so like i said we could definitely i i think that this could be another conversation um, mm -hmm. that we can kind of, I really would be interested in fleshing that out because it is something that needs to be talked about. Right. Um, and from the perspective of an African-American woman in the justice system, like, I think that's a, I think that's like a conversation <laughs> that needs to just, just be yeah. had. Um, yeah. so, you know, um, ladies, as you're listening, um, one, I want you to hear, you know, every time we talk to another woman in business, mm -hmm. um, and you start to tell your story, it really, it really fleshes out the fact that your where you are today was fueled by passion, um, because you set yourself. I didn't set out to be no lawyer. I didn't. That was not on my radar. Okay, I was gonna, you know, do this, this, and this over here. I was gonna do other things, and passion interfered or interrupted your your quest, and took you on a different route. Um, and so, for the ladies who are listening, yes, we're gonna get to the business stuff, but I need you to hear that business, sustainable business is undergirded by passion. Don't tell me you're an entrepreneur and you're not passionate about what you're doing. Because yeah. It will not last. It will not stand. 
Um, and and what's what's uh, for you to do is a lot bigger than I just want to make some money. Mm. Like passion and purpose is bigger than a paycheck. Um, and so I need you to hear that um, right now. So Kiana, thank you for you know bringing us to this point. Um, so so continue on. Um, so bring us around to how you started working with businesses. Yes, yes. So um, thank you, because I, I am really passionate, as you can tell, and I will definitely go into all that at a later date. Um, but you said something so key that I want to highlight. Sometimes passion is all we have, especially before you get the first invoice paid as an entrepreneur. That's all you have is passion, okay? That's going to be the only thing that's going to keep you up at night. That's going to get you up in the morning. So if you do not have that, then it's going to be hard to make it. Um, but along those same lines, I found that I lost my passion for prosecuting in 2020 because of everything that happened, because of Ahmaud Aubrey. That happened right in Georgia, right down the street. Um, I became so disenfranchised with my role because I said, here I am prosecuting Black men for death by shoplifting. I'm offering them a year in prison, but this young Black man was chased down like a dog and shot in the street. And so I said, I, I can't do it. I lost my passion for that. And so I shifted and I, um, the Lord just started giving me visions about having my own law firm. And I knew that it was gonna be a social justice based law firm. Didn't quite know how I was gonna get there. Um, but all around me on social media, my friends, family, I see people, you know, opening these businesses and, you know, you know, 2020 COVID, everybody- It was lit. <laughs> Yes, they were making hand sanitizer. People were doing all kinds of things. And I said, this is awesome and amazing. And that's also when I decided to start my own business. But I realized, like, wait, I don't know how to start a business. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I really assume, people assume, and I also assume, oh, I'm attorney. I can figure it out. But no, I really had to study. I really had to see what is the proper way to really start a business. Um, because in law school, you will find, like any other school, right, they teach you theory, but they don't always teach you application. They don't teach you how to walk that thing out. And so I really had to study and learn, okay, how do I legally start this business? And I'll get to that. But I want to also say that I was excited to see Black and Brown people starting businesses because I see that as a way of leveling the playing field in terms of the justice system. And so another thing I realized um, while being in the justice system is that, you know, it's the haves and the have nots. And it's about race, but it's also about money. And if you have money, you're going to impact the, the justice system in a much different way than if you don't have money. And so I really see entrepreneurship as a vehicle to having um equal rights under the justice system. And so I was so excited to see black and brown people starting businesses because that means wealth is being generated in our homes and in our community. And so um, I started my own law firm and that's how I started working with businesses is because I realized this is a need. People are just starting social media pages and selling hand sanitizer. They haven't registered with the secretary of state. They don't have insurance. They don't have any terms on that uh, hand sanitizer that says, hey, you might be allergic to this. Be careful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. People were just kind of jumping out there. And I said, OK, Lord, I see the need. And um, and so I went in that direction. And so my law firm actually offers uh, services to new businesses and entrepreneurs, but also we offer civil rights litigation services as well. So we offer both those things. That's awesome. Awesome. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I'm 34. Okay. Good. Like, so I just need y'all to hear that the millennials, we up in here killing it. Okay. We are. We are. <laughs> we are doing the dang on thing. I love it. I love it. I love it. And you're right. When 2020 hit, everybody started a business. They was like, oh, y'all need these Q-tips? Three for five. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, and I think really, um, too, not that this is about race, but it really, really just awakened or not even awakened, but highlighted and brought to the forefront the entrepreneurial spirit of the African-American community um, and even like the black and brown community. Right. Like there's just a hustling kind of something that that we've got. And like you said, people just blew up and were like, yo, I'm, I, I started a business and you're absolutely right. They put the page up on Facebook and said, I'm open for business. 
Yes. And you know, and, and I'll be, I'll be transparent. I was not in 2020, but mm -hmm. I was one of those people that was like, well, people are paying me for these cupcakes. So I'm finna, you know, slinging these cupcakes. Right. I had no insurance, Lord. I didn't have an LLC. Yeah. I have nothing but a phone number and some cupcakes. Right. Um, you know, and so to your point, when you know better, you do better. Yeah. Um, because you also mentioned how the justice system is not built for our favor, right? And so if we can't be caught selling drugs, well, I'm going to get you for having a, a business without it being set up properly, I right? Yes. Um, and so we need to guard ourselves against those um, loopholes, right. um, you know, that can that can really work against us, especially like there are so many talented people um, that started business. I mean, there were some people that didn't have talent that started businesses, but there were lots of great, great businesses that were born um, out of the pandemic. So, um, so give us just a quick and dirty rundown of if I wanted to start selling today something, um, what are my first steps? Your first steps. So what I usually tell people who come to me, um, whether it's a consultation or they're already a client and have a new idea, I say, what is your vision? And, and one thing that I used to do when I was practicing as a prosecutor and, you know, I was preparing for trial, I would think, what is my end goal? And I would start how I wanted to end, right? So if I wanted to, at the end, if I wanted to prove hey, this person robbed this person at, at gunpoint, then I had to start that way. I had to compile my witness list. I had to compile my evidence based on what I was trying to prove at the end. And so I tell my entrepreneurs the same thing. Where do you see your business going? What is your vision? And then we're going to start based on what you see at the end. Because what I see a lot when I encounter people, sometimes when they just jump off and just, oh, I'm just going to register for this LLC, that's not even the, the proper business structure that they need. So I would say, get clear on your vision. What is your vision? Are you selling a product? Are you offering a service? Do you see your product is being offered in several states? Do you see it as being an international product? Do you need investors to come on board? Because that's going to change your, your business model. Um, investors pr prefer corporations over LLCs. So if you want that investor money, you might want to consider a corporation. How much time do you have? Do you have the time to, co to commit to a corporation? Do you have partners? Can you build up a board? No, if not, then you might want to do an LLC. So really ask yourself those, those questions. Really think about what your vision is. Is this um, a business you want to keep close to your chest? If so, then you might want to have an LLC because once you have a corporation, then you're welcoming other people to your vision. And then they have some ownership stake in it, depending on how you break up your shareholders, right? And so all those questions are questions you want to consider. And of course, certain industries, um, certain business structures are, are going to be better. So if you're going into, you know, maybe like real estate and you just need something quick and easy because you want to buy your business, then, I mean, you want to buy the home, then an LLC would be, you know, probably the best vehicle. But like I said, if you're building an app, the corporation is probably going to be the best vehicle because then you can have shares um, and you can sell those shares. So, you know, and you can be publicly traded. So if your vision is to be on the stock market one day, you don't want an LLC because an LLC can't be publicly traded. And so really first get clear on what your vision is, your who, what, where, when, why. Heavy on the why, right? Um, and then from there, really think about, okay, now that I know what I want to do, what my vision is, what is the proper structure for this? And I really needed to, I really needed to study that. Like, I'm not being funny. I need to, I had to really sit down, sit down and make a list, the differences between LLCs, corporations, LLPs, partnerships. I mean, I had to really sit down and study those things to really see what would be the proper entity, even for my business. Um, and then definitely advising people, I have to know the difference between those things. And so I would say, if you don't have the time to commit to really studying the differences, then maybe at that point you want to engage an attorney. Um, but it is a very important consideration. Awesome. 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 Um, and ladies, that's not the first time that we've heard that in terms of before you start, there's some real work that you have to do before you put your first product out on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, and really asking yourself the question, like even before you start to map out a vision, is entrepreneurship for me? 
Mm. Um, I feel like entrepreneurship has become trendy. Yeah. Um, you know, and so many people are like, I'm gonna start a business because I don't want to, I don't want no boss. I want to be my own boss and I don't want to work a nine to five. Not realizing that when you become an entrepreneur, you're now working 24 seven. There is no nine to like, there's no break. Like, <laughs> you know, you wake up at 3 a.m. like, oh, snap, I got to post this or, you know, whatever. Like you have to set your own deadlines. There's a whole level of discipline and driving yourself and self-starterness that's required for entrepreneurship. You need to have tough skin. You need to, you know, be able to bounce back and be resilient when things don't go right. You need to be able to think quickly on your feet. So, you know, there's a lot of mindset work that also needs to happen. Mindset work and then getting clear about the vision. Um, Kiana, you made a great point. Like, I didn't even think about, do I want to be publicly traded one day? You know what I'm saying? And so it's like, well, dang, that sounds, that actually sounds good. Like, so now what do I need to do? Like, what kind of business do I need to dream up? Right. Um, yeah. You know, to, to position myself, because I'm an LLC right now. Mm -hmm. I ain't going to be traded as a publicly traded business because I'm an LLC. Yes. Uh, so, you know, you just even drop some gems, even just in explaining that there are multiple structures. Um, and like you said, if you're not sure, ladies, like you can Google all day, but if you're not sure, it makes better sense to engage an attorney and get it right the first time so that you're not jacking yourself up and then come tax time. You don't know how to file and who to file. And you, you know, didn't, didn't do taxes or didn't pay taxes. Like there's a lot, there's yeah. a lot that goes into it. And so you want to make sure that you are going into this educated and informed. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. So my next question is, um, aside from not doing the proper setup from a structure standpoint, standpoint, mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see legally um, that small business owners or entrepreneurs are making these days? Not having insurance. Um, I would say nine out of 10 entrepreneurs I engage with and they're like, OK, yeah, I started my business. I did this. I did that. I say, OK, what, what, what type of insurance do you have? They're like, insurance. I'm like, ma'am, <laughs> please get some insurance. So what I tell people is. If your business is going to be engaging with the public, you need insurance. So that's all businesses, right? Um, even if you're going to be engaging with, with animals, right? They have owners. So you need insurance, basically. Um, if you don't have insurance, you're basically volunteering to pay for all the issues that may go wrong. And I don't think anybody wants to do that. So not having insurance is a huge issue. Also, not using contracts. Mm -hmm. um, so my business... <laughs> <laughs> I also, as part of my firm, I also offer um, contract drafting and interpretation. And so I might have somebody come to me and say, hey, you know, I hired this person to build my website. I, I paid the money. I haven't heard from them in three months. I'm like, oh, OK, send me your contract. What could, wait, I didn't. Oh, wait, I was supposed to. Yes, child. <laughs> you paid three thousand dollars. You did what? <laughs> you don't have a contract. So, um, yes, use contracts. If you are engaging with people who aren't sending you one, send them one. I hired a um, a chef, a personal chef for my husband's um, birthday in December. She was wonderful, but she sent me the contract in a Word document. I said, do you mind if I just send this to you via DocuSign so we both can sign it? And she said, sure. What would be the point of having a contract with a Word document with my signature that, that doesn't have her signature? If a contract is not signed by both parties, it, it's not enforceable. And if it's a Word doc, I can go up in there and change some things, you know? And exactly. exactly. And so um, if someone is not, and this is not to, to knock on her because she's wonderful. She's great. I prefer her to somebody else and the food was delicious. But what I'm saying is if, if somebody is approaching you and you know this is not, you know, proper, it's not really protecting you, it's not protecting them, then do something about it. You know, right. send them a contract. Right. Maybe a DocuSign, send it, you know, a, a secure way. So definitely using contracts is important. And I actually, I teach a course on contracts. I talk to a lot of uh, Christian entrepreneurs, especially in church, about contracting, because I think we have kind of been um, bread to, to, to say we have to give our gifts to the kingdom and we have to, you know, work for Girl. And, and do all those different things. And it's not true. I mean, not that we shouldn't give up our talent and our gifts. We should, but it shouldn't be all the time. So don't be afraid to send your sister in Christ a contract. <laughs> you know, Ooh, 
Ooh, you you meddling now. <laughs> Don't be afraid to send your pastor an invoice. You know, honestly, you know, because we we shouldn't be expected, and God didn't expect that that we just give and give and give. How yeah. about our bills? He right. said we're supposed to be the lender, not the borrower. Okay, that means that we have some money coming in, right? And Absolutely. so, um, using contracts is very important, even if you're doing free work. And people think, oh, it's I'm doing it for free. Okay, but you need people to know what your parameters are. A contract is nothing more than a communication device. This is what I'm giving. This is what you're getting. This is what both sides are giving in exchange for what they're getting. So even when you're doing something free, you write it in a contract so that both parties are clear on the boundaries. Because what you have is a lot of situations where, um, you know, say I'm doing, I don't know, a free legal class for the church on contracting. And they said, oh, I thought you were going to draft all our contracts. No, ma'am. I thought I was going to teach a course, right? But if we don't have that written down, then that's where we have, you know, we can have disagreement. And not because one party is trying to get over, maybe we're just remembering things differently. That happens, you know? And so definitely using contracts. And then I will, I will lastly say discipline. Going to your point, I have an um, entrepreneur prayer call that the Lord placed on my heart. This just the second week we did it was on Monday. Um, and the Lord gave me Proverbs 6.6, 6, consider the ant. And so that was the focus of our study on Monday, consider the ant. And that, that passage talks about how the ant doesn't have an overseer or a ruler, but she gathers, you know, uh, food to, to prepare for scarcity, you know. And I said, wait, she don't have an overseer. She's an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know what I mean? She don't have a boss. And so to your point um, about saying, no, I'm going to start my own business because I don't have a boss. You do have a boss. Number one, if you're a Christian entrepreneur, the Lord is your boss. And we are to do all things as unto him, right? So he's your boss. But then you're also your own boss. So if you're not doing a good job, you're your own employee and your own boss, right? And so you got to answer to yourself. You got to look yourself in the mirror and say, hey, I didn't do X, Y, Z. I need to tighten up in these areas. And we have to just be diligent. We have to be like the ant. You know, we have to prepare for scarcity because it's going to come. You know, just in my own personal journey in November, I was bawling. I was like, oh, I got stacks. You know what I mean? I said, what you want for your birthday, boo? You know, I got yeah. No. Um, and then January came and I was like, Where girl, you? <laughs> you, know I mean? you talking right. Yes, yes. And so I have to prepare, you know, I have to prepare my business even for those ebbs and flows of business. And so we've got to be disciplined and diligent in our businesses. Absolutely. Did y'all get all that? Because that was really good. She said insurance. She said contracts. And she said discipline. These three things are the biggest things that we kind of forego. And, and when we do forego them, it comes back to bite us at the end of the day. Um, and so even like with the contracts, I know, I think for women, even specifically, mm -hmm. we're afraid to, um, to put contracts in the equation because it feels, you know, assertive. It feels, uh, um, but at the end of the day, you put yourself in a position to be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, contracts don't have to be 99 pages long, mm -hmm. you know, like Kiana said, it's just a, a communication that says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to do. And this is what we're both going to get. Do we agree? We both sign it. Yes, we agree. Um, and it's really a protection for you. Um, I think oftentimes we give away way too much anyway, as it is, we have an issue with pricing ourselves properly. We have an issue with saying no. Um, and so these contracts really make you stick to what you said you were going to do. Um, and even putting in the contract that, hey, I am willing to go above and beyond the terms of this contract, but just know that there's going to be an additional fee assessed. Like wow. it's okay <laughs> to say that, you know, because too many times, um, you know, and, and even if you're like me, like I'm passionate about what I do. So mm -hmm. if I get to a point in the project and I see that something else needs to be done, sometimes I'll just go ahead and do it because it needs to be done. Not even remembering to say, oh, well, this wasn't even a part of what we talked about, mm -hmm. you know? And then if I don't put that little clause that says, you know, if we go beyond the scope of work, I'm going to charge you extra. I can't charge them extra. And I don't already did the work, right. you know? So you have to, it's, it's about you protecting yourself. Um, and then the same thing with the insurance. So Kiana, um, 
if I have a service-based business that's strictly online, mm -hmm. I still need insurance? You still need insurance, yes. Um, and I tell people like this, you know, and I sometimes I use morbid examples is because I'm an attorney. I'm not speaking this over anybody. But say, you know, you have a virtual business and say you're a coach. This is a good example. You're a coach and um, you, you talk to your client and some personal things come up, right? She's like, you know what? I, I just feel like, you know, I have all these things to do in my business. I'm overwhelmed. I'm feeling a little depressed. I, I just don't know the next step. And, and you're like, hey, you know, maybe you should see a therapist. Like, I'm a coach. You know, maybe you should see a therapist. What if that person doesn't, right? And she ends up, God forbid, you know, taking a bottle of pills. And now she's like, well, I'm suing because you were my coach and I got depressed and, and you didn't help me. Well, I told you to get, you know, I told you to see a therapist. I told you I was just a coach. But people can sue, right? People can do what they want. If somebody can sue over hot coffee at McDonald's, right? Which that, that case is actually bad. We use it like that like she shouldn't have but it was really bad the burns were terrible if you see the pictures but i digress mm -hmm. but if somebody can sue for coffee which you know is hot right people can sue for anything and so if they feel like you did not live up to your end of your coaching responsibilities and that was all virtual they can still decide i'm going to sue you um and so your insurance company would step in at that point um if you are entering into a contract right if you are saying I'm going to um, tutor you, you know, for a year and it's $2,000 a month. So that's a $24,000 contract. And you breach that contract for whatever reason, you know, Lord forbid, maybe you get COVID or something and, and you can't meet for a month. And the person says, hey, I'm suing you. You breached the contract. Well, yeah, that was virtual, but now you have a breach of contract claim, possible claim. Your insurance can cover that for you. And so even if you have a virtual business, if you're ever interfacing with a person, you need to have insurance. Got you. Got you. Thank you for that. I know there are a lot of people listening and like, oh, snap. <laughs> and it's um, not too expensive. I think people assume like, oh, insurance is expensive. It's not that expensive. We're talking 20 to $30 a month. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so listen, ladies. I hope you've been taking notes. I hope you've been getting something out of this conversation. I know I have. Um, so Kiana, tell us um, any last thoughts, any last encouragements, and then you can also tell us how, you know, what you have for us to take advantage of today and how we can connect. Yeah, sure. Um, last points. I would say just stay in carriage in your business. You know, you talked about it earlier about needing perseverance. And I would say, just definitely stay in carriage. Issues and problems will come up. That does not mean that entrepreneurship is not for you. It just means that you're in a season and that God is building you up in your resiliency. So I would say bet on yourself, invest in yourself. When we're working in someone else's business, which is fine, but what we're doing is investing in their dream. And so I know God put a dream inside all of us. So invest in yourself. Don't leave yourself off the table. I see more, so many people do that. They invest in everybody else but themselves. And investing in yourselves looks like different things. It can be starting a business. It could be going back to school. It could be opening an investment account, right? Because you need money when you get older. And so definitely invest in yourself. Um, and I will also say, I believe that entrepreneurship is for everyone. I believe that that's God's best for us. If we look at the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden had four streams flowing into it. So I'm not going to say you have to necessarily start this business and, and quit your job, but I believe that we should have multiple streams of income. And entrepreneurship looks different depending on where you are in life. So entrepreneurship could look like you working full time and having a side business. It could look like you purchasing a rental property and um, renting that out to a tenant. That's still a business. It could look like you having multiple investments accounts, you know what I mean? Or having a hobby that you monetize in some way. And entrepreneurship can look so different. It's, right. it's not a cookie cutter. So pursue it though, in some form, because you want more than one stream flowing into your home. Um, in terms of how to reach me, I'm accessible on, I'm usually on Facebook. Um, I'm on Facebook under my name, Kiana Chanel. I'm trying to get better with IG but I'm not the best with being present on there. But my handle on there is KC, as in my initials, KC Solves. 
And then my website is chanotlaw.com. And so those are ways that you can get in touch with me. Um, as far as what I'm offering, starting in March, I have a, um, a business slash law course that I'll be offering. It's called Push Next Level. And it's a compliance course for entrepreneurs. Because what I find is a lot of people, they start, right? They may start legally, but then they kind of fall, fall to the wayside. And so once you have a business, look, the Bible says to who much is given, much is required, right? So now you have the business. Now you have to stay compliant. And so are you keeping your meeting minutes? Are you having your meetings? Um, is your insurance still up to date? Um, are you, do you have contracts that you're using? Do they need to be updated? So we're, we're going to be talking about all those things and really getting all those things into place if you don't have them. You know, are you paying your annual registration? So um, it's, it's a legal compliance course for people who have already started their businesses. So awesome. Yeah, if you're interested in that, definitely let me know. And besides that, you know, I offer just business services. If you're being sued, if you need it to someone, I also offer those um, type of services in terms of business and, of course, civil rights as well. Awesome. Awesome. Listen, ladies, this was awesome. This was amazing. Kiana, thank you so much for sharing and hanging out with us today. For sure. um, so, ladies, you heard what she's offering Specifically for those of you who are already in business, I would encourage you to uh, follow up and get connected so that you can get into that compliance course. I think that's um, I think it's important for us to stay on top of our business, not mm -hmm. just the selling of the products or the services, but making sure that everything is straight in the background. I'm talking to myself, too. I'm not, you know, giving you guys anything that I don't also need to be doing. Um, it's, it's like, you know, um, preventative health care. Right. You're doing right. it so that you don't die when you get a cold, right? Something that could have been prevented, you know? So we wanna make sure that we're doing what we need to do. Um, make sure you guys head on over to the Female Coaches, Consultants, and Content Creators group on Facebook to hang out with me there. You'll get more of these interviews you get to watch. I don't know if you're watching or listening right now, but if you're just listening, you can watch in the group and vice versa. Um, and I would love to see you guys in that community. So thank you for hanging out with us. And we'll see you next week on another episode of the Brittany Smith Podcast. Bye. Bye.